<clears throat> the subcommittee will come to order. The subcommittee is meeting today to receive testimony on the need for a national agro-biodefense <coughs> facility. Good afternoon and uh, welcome to the Subcommittee on Emerging Threats, Cybersecurity and Science and Technology hearing on the need to reduce threats to our nation's agricultural sector. Today the Subcommittee will receive testimony regarding the National Bio and Agro Defense Facility, known as NBAF. We are all well aware that biological threats, both man-made and naturally occurring, present a real danger to the security of the United States. In previous hearings, we have heard from experts on how best to protect against a variety of biological threats and how to strengthen programs like BioShield to effectively procure countermeasures. Today, we will focus our attention on protecting against zoonic uh, diseases, which affect both animals and humans and can be devastating <coughs> to our agricultural sector. The agricultural industry is a critical component of our economy and is responsible for much of our nation's food supply. We must therefore do any, everything possible to ensure its safety and security, and this includes strengthening our defenses against zoonotic diseases. Investing in research and development will yield new and innovative technologies and allow us to effectively combat these diseases. These advances will aid in our understanding of disease transmission and development of countermeasures to mitigate dis disease outbreaks. For over 50 years, the Plum Island Animal Disease Center <coughs> has served the nation as a key research facility for foreign animal diseases. That facility is now over a half century old, and both the departments represented here today agree that an upgraded facility is necessary. For years, Plum Island was one of many animal disease research centers run by the U.S. Department of Agriculture, and it fulfilled a unique function partly due to its placement on an island off the U.S. mainland. Current law, which dates back to 1948, requires that live foot and mouth disease virus must be studied on an island to protect against an outbreak on the U.S. mainland. This law has served us well through the years, but experts, including our witnesses today, <coughs> believe that current containment technology is safe enough for this virus to be studied on the U.S. mainland uh, within the confines of a proper facility. Today, we will hear from officials both from DHS and USDA on a proposal to change current law to allow for a national bio agro and agro defense facility. The NBAF will be a new and secure facility located on the mainland capable of housing a broad range of zoonotic diseases. The NBAF will significantly enhance our knowledge of these agents and will advance our capability to produce, produce effective countermeasures. <clears throat> and we have certainly seen the devastation that can be caused by the outbreak of zoonotic diseases such as foot and mouth disease. The outbreak of foot and mouth disease in the United Kingdom in 2001 caused 2,000 disease, uh, caused 2,000 cases of the disease in farms throughout the British countryland, countryside. To stop the spread of the disease, 7 million sheep and cattle were killed and altogether the crisis is estimated to have cost Britain 8 billion pounds, the equivalent of 15 billion dollars. This crisis emphasizes the ongoing need for foot and mouth disease research to provide vaccines and other countermeasures to protect cattle, dairy, pork, and sheep industries. It also highlights, highlights the importance of having this, a state-of-the-art facility with biosafety level 3 and 4 capabilities to ensure that the diseases studied there will not uh, present a threat to the food and agricultural sectors of our economy. I believe that the proposed facility can meet these challenges and I laud uh, both the Department of Homeland Security and the Department of Agriculture for their forward thinking on this issue. As you know, the committee is currently working on a bill uh, introduced by uh, Ranking Member McCall to authorize such a facility. I'm a proud co-sponsor of that legislation and I commend the Ranking Member for his leadership on this issue. The committee has been uh, talking to our <coughs> colleagues on the committee on uh, agriculture, <coughs> members of the administration represented by our new witnesses here today, and several professional organizations regarding the bill language. We appreciate the feedback of our experts, such as our witnesses here today, and we plan to have the bill ready for a markup in a few weeks. I again want to thank the witnesses for being here today, and I look forward to your testimony. The chair now recognizes the ranking member of the subcommittee, the gentleman from Texas, Mr. McCall, for an opening statement. And I, <coughs> I thank the chairman for holding this hearing today. I um, I must say, while well, I was disappointed that uh, my provision authorizing the National Bio and Agro Defense Facility was stripped from the DHS authorization bill, uh, I do appreciate and uh, applaud 
uh, your efforts and Chairman Thompson's uh, to move H.R. 1717 as a standalone bill and look forward to marking it up in the coming weeks. I realize that the problem we ran into uh, with this provision uh, being included in the authorization and with many others uh, that were removed were due to overlapping interests with other uh, committees. Uh, even so, I don't think there's any disagreement that, in, that MBAF is a crucial component to our nation's strategy to defend against agro-terrorism and that MBAF will address unmet needs. As I've stated before, there is currently uh, there is no BSL-4 capability for research on zoonotic diseases, and we shouldn't let turf battles prevent the Department uh, from addressing these issues and having the tools that it needs to protect this country. Uh, my staff is currently in the process of fine-tuning H.R. 1717 along with your staff to make it clear that MBAF will be a coordinated interagency effort with an overarching Homeland Security mission. They are reaching out to the relevant stakeholders in the agricultural community, such as the National Cattlemen's Beef Association uh, and the Animal Agriculture Coalition, uh, to ensure that 1717 addresses and meets the needs of the agriculture community. Uh, clearly, the time is right now to foster collaboration between veterinary medicine, human medicine, public health, and the environmental health sciences. DHS is positioned to do this with MBAF. Through the USDA's fundamental research and DHS's targeted advanced development, this facility will help protect the veterinary, food, and agriculture industries of the United States. I hope we, we being the congressional committees with the oversight of agro-terrorism activities, can lead by example, uh, present a unified effort uh, to move H.R. 1717 forward. I want to thank our witnesses for appearing uh, here today, and I hope your due diligence and the MBAF site selection process continues unabated as we look to this future capability. I look forward to hearing from each of you on, uh, about how you are working together on foreign animal and zoonotic disease research and how that relationship will, will transition when MBAF stands up. Uh, and I yield back my time. Thank the ranking member. The chair now recognizes the chairman of the full committee, the gentleman from Mississippi, Mr. Thompson, for an opening statement. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, uh, and I want to thank you for holding this hearing on what is clearly a vital issue facing our nation. Many of us remember the stir caused when former Secretary of Health and Human Services Tommy Thompson announced his resignation, warning that the U.S. food supply could be a lethal target for terrorists and we are at significant risk of a flu pandemic. Homeland Security Presidential Directive 9 issued in 2004, identified the need for safe, secure, and state-of-the-art biosafety laboratories that research and develop diagnostic capabilities for foreign animal and zoonotic diseases. We understand that Plum Island Animal Disease Center in New York is currently performing much of this research and is nearing the end of its life cycle. <clears throat> the threat of foreign animal diseases, especially zoonotic diseases, to the public health and the agricultural industries has been a, rel a reality for many years. The Committee on Homeland Security recognizes the need for increased vigilance in fighting and protecting against the spread of current and future infectious diseases that threaten public health and agriculture. We all un also understand that the current research lab at Plum Island was designated primarily to study the accidental introduction of foreign disease agents and not the additional research needed to prepare for an intentional bioterrorism attack. I'm pleased this committee is moving forward with efforts to address the issue of the aging research facility, act on the guidance offered through HSPD-9, and assess the current working relationship between DHS and USDA. I look forward to hearing from the witnesses today regarding the need for an NBAF facility in meeting the requirement of Homeland Security Presidential Directive 9. I thank the Chairman uh, for his time, and I yield back my, the balance. I thank the Chairman. Uh, the other members of the subcommittee are reminded that under the committee rules, the opening statements may be submitted for the record. I'd like to now welcome our witnesses. Our first witness, Dr. John Vitko, is currently the Division Head of the Chemical and Biological Division of the Science and Technology Director the Department of Homeland Security. In that role, 
He has the overall responsibility uh, for all DHS s and to deter, detect, and mitigate uh, our, a bio biological or chemical attack on the people, infrastructure, or agriculture of this nation. Prior to that, John was a uh, director of exploratory systems at Sandia National Laboratories, Livermore, California, where he has been since receiving his PhD in physics from Cornell University in 1975. A second witness is Dr. Edward Nippling, the administrator of the Agricultural Research Service. He began his career with the Agricultural Research Service in 1968 as a research plant physiologist in Gainesville, Florida. He has held many positions in ARS, including <coughs> Area Director, Associate Deputy Administrator, Director, and Deputy Administrator, Administrator of the Beltsville Agricultural Research Center. Dr. Nippling served as Acting Administrator, Associate Administrator, uh, Administrator of ARS in December 1997. Dr. Nippling was appointed Administrator of ARS in July 2004. He earned his B.S. in 1961 in forestry from Virginia Tech University. He received his M.A. in 1963 and Ph.D. in 1966 in plant physiology from Duke University. Dr. Kipling will be giving uh, a testimony for both himself uh, and uh, our, our third witness, Dr. Kevin Shea. Mr. Kevin Shea, correction. Uh, Kevin Shea was appointed Associate Administrator of the Animal and Plant Health Inspection Service, APHIS, on September 9, 2004. In this position, he is responsible for ensuring the smooth day-to-day -day functions of APHIS. Mr. Shea spent four years as head of uh, APHIS's policy and program development staff. Before becoming director of uh, PPD, uh, Mr. Shea served as director of APHIS's budget and accounting division for eight years and several other positions within APHIS uh, where he has been almost continuously uh, since 1978, taking one year hiatus to practice litigation. Mr. Shea, Shea graduated from University of Maryland uh, at uh, College Park and earned his, a, a Juris Doctorate from the University of Baltimore School of Law. Uh, gentlemen, welcome here today. Without objection, the witness's full statements will be in, uh, inserted into the record, <coughs> and I will now ask each witness to uh, uh, summarize their, uh, their statement for five minutes, beginning with Dr. Bitko. Welcome. Welcome. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chairman Langevin, Ranking Member McCall, full committee Chairman Thompson, and distinguished members of the subcommittee. My name is Dr. John Vitko, and I'm the head of the Chemical and Biological Division of the Science and Technology Directorate of the Department of Homeland Security. In that role, I have re overall responsibility for all DHS science and technology programs related to bio and agro defense and work very closely with our colleagues in the United States Department of Agriculture. And in that role, I'm pleased to appear before you today to speak to the need for the National Bio and Agro Defense Facility, NBAF, and to give you some idea of the importance, important work that will be done there. NBAF is vitally needed to meet the foreign animal and zoonotic disease challenges for today and for the next 50 years. There are three key drivers underlying that need. One, Foreign animal and zoonotic diseases can have a major impact on our economy, food supply, and public health. The threats to the nation's agriculture and public health have changed dramatically since the time of the establishment of Plum Island. These changes include the globalization of travel and trade, the broadened size and scope of the U.S. livestock and agricultural industry, newly emergent diseases, and now the threat of agroterrorism. Second, the Plum Island Animal Disease Center which has been the first line of the nation's defense against foreign animal diseases for the past 50 years, is unable to fully address this growing threat of agroterrorism. Its limited laboratory space, especially that for testing large animals, is limiting the pace of development of vaccines for foot and mouth disease, and also the ability to expand programs addressing the numerous other high priority foreign animal diseases of concern. Third, the nation lacks a facility for addressing high-consequence zoonotic diseases that infect both large animals and humans. The impact of disease agents such as Rift Valley fever, Nipah, and Hendra viruses underscore the growing threat posed by emerging zoonotic diseases. As already referenced by Chairman Thompson, the President in his defense for the United States agriculture and food called for planning for the state-of-art agricultural biocontainment laboratories that research and develop diagnostic capabilities for foreign animal and zoonotic diseases. 
That same HSPD called for expanding the development of current and new countermeasures against both intentional and, and natural introductions of those diseases. NBAF is being designed to fulfill both those requirements and to support our needs of our partners in the United States Department of Agriculture. NBAF will provide state-of-the-art biocontainment laboratories for the development, test, evaluation of diagnostics and countermeasures of foreign animal and zoonotic diseases. It will integrate those aspects of animal and public health research that are key to fulfilling that mission. It will help attract, train, and retain future generations of researchers, technicians, diagnosticians, veterinary, and medical personnel. And by so doing, it will continue to meet evolving needs in defending against agroterrorism over the next five decades. NBAF is being designed to concurrently develop multiple priority vaccine candidates and to enable the broad range of activities needed to support that development. Those activities include basic research on how organisms infect animals and how that inf infection is transmitted from animal to animal, identification of lead candidates for new vaccines and antivirals, novel delivery systems, think of that as the ways of administering the medicine to speed response actions, pilot lot production and testing of vaccines, clinical testing to support licensure and for inclusion in national veterinary stockpile, the development of diagnostics to rapidly identify, characterize, and control outbreaks, and the training of veterinarians to establish a rapid response capability throughout the United States. NBAF will be operated in partnership with and support of our colleagues in the Department of Agriculture in much the same manner that we are currently operating the Plum Island Animal Disease Center. In summary, NBAF is vital to meeting the agro-defense needs of the nation for the next 50 years, just as PIADC has been vital to meeting those needs for the past 50 years. Therefore, we at DHS are committed to making NBAF a reality to support our partners in the Agricultural Research Service and in the Animal, plant, animal and Plant Health and Inspection Service. Thank you. This concludes my testimony. Thank you, Mr. Vitko, uh, Dr. Vitko, and uh, uh, thank you for your testimony. And uh, I'd like to now recognize Dr. Uh, Dr. Nippling uh, to summarize uh, your statement for five minutes. Uh, Mr. Chairman, Chairman Thompson, Ranking uh, Member McCall, and other members of the subcommittee, I am Edward Nippling, the administrator of the USDA Agriculture Research Service, and thank you for the opportunity to appear before the subcommittee today to pre present the department's views on the establishment of NBAF. I will provide brief uh, oral comments to summarize the principal points in my written testimony and to reinforce and supplement those just provided by Dr. Vitko of DHS. First, let me acknowledge once again that accompanying me today from USDA is Mr. Kevin Shea, the Associate Administrator of the Animal and Plant Health Inspection Service, APHIS. APHIS is the uh, regulatory and operations uh, arm of the department of the department responsible for protecting and promoting U.S. agriculture, including diagnostics, uh, training, and development of products uh, related to the prevention and control of animal diseases. ARS is the intramural science research arm of USDA. We make basic science discoveries and develop new technologies needed and used by APHIS, DHS, other agencies, and in fact the entire food and agricultural system to protect and advance U.S. agriculture. My comments today will address two main points. One, the need for and the merits of NBAF relative to the limited capabilities of the existing facilities at the Plum Island Animal Disease Center. And two, to describe the agreements and mechanisms USDA and DHS already have in place to ensure cooperation, uh, complementarity, and coordination of our respective programs and operations at Plum Island and elsewhere, and, and to be continued in the new NBAF. Mr. Chairman, the need to establish NBAF is basically twofold. First, it is needed to replace the aging facility at Plum Island, and second, it is needed to provide additional space and capability, including large animal biosafety level four laboratories, to study and develop controls and countermeasures uh, for high consequence uh, foreign animal pathogens that, that threaten the U.S. livestock industry, some of which could also be transmitted to, to humans, thus threatening public health as well. As already well pointed out, the current facilities at Plum Island uh, are outdated 
and otherwise inadequate. NBAF will fulfill the new needs for the nation. Regarding USDA and DHS cooperation and coordination, the Homeland Security Act of 2002 required the Secretary of Homeland Security and the Secretary of Agriculture to enter into an agreement to ensure that USDA is able to carry out research, diagnostics, and other USDA activities at Plum Island. Accordingly, the two agencies uh, of USDA, ARS and APHIS, and the Science and Technology Directorate of DHS entered into an interagency agreement dated June 1, 2003, which together with successor annual agreements set forth the terms for the management, administration, and operations at Plum Island. And according to this agreement, a board of directors is composed of the director of the DHS Science and Technology Directorate, the administrators of ARS and APHIS. This includes Dr. Vitko, myself, and the APHIS administrator, Dr. Ron Haven, represented here today by Mr. Shea. Additionally, a senior leadership group uh, composed of the on-site leaders for each agency at Plum Island implement programs and policies, coordinate at the local level, and report to the Board of Directors. <coughs> a copy of the interagency agreement document executed uh, in 2006 for the current uh, 2007 seven fiscal year has previously been provided to the subcommittee for the record along with my written testimony. This document also spells out in general terms the division of program responsibilities among the three agencies with respect to foreign animal diseases. Very simply, the role of ARS is basic and applied research. APHIS responsibilities uh, include disease diagnostics, training, and the maintenance of a vaccine stockpile. DHS responsibilities are to build upon and extend USDA work to develop and evaluate advanced animal disease uh, countermeasure products in, in concert with the private sector. And foot and mouth disease uh, is the primary focus of animal pathogen work at Plum Island, but some other diseases are, are also addressed. The uh, complementary and coordinated responsibilities, uh, program strategies, and plans of work of the three agencies are outlined in much greater detail in two documents also provided to the subcommittee for the record. And these, uh, these documents are entitled, uh, one, a comprehensive strategy to combat agroterrorism issued by DHS in 2004, and the second, a joint DHS and USDA strategy for foreign animal disease research and, di and diagnostic programs also issued in 2004. Mr. Chairman, this concludes my remarks. Uh, both Mr. Shea and I would be pleased to answer any questions that you have of USDA. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Tipoik, and I want to thank uh, all the witnesses for their testimony today. Um, I'll remind each member that he or she will have five minutes to question the panel, and I now recognize myself uh, for uh, questions. Uh, to the panel, uh, as I mentioned in my opening remarks, uh, and as Dr. Vitko also stated, an outbreak of foot and mouth disease uh, otherwise known as FMD, could be extremely damaging to uh, the agricultural sector and our overall uh, economy in general. Uh, one of the major concerns regarding uh, MBAF is, of course, uh, the studying of live foot and mouth disease virus on the U.S. mainland, which has historically been studied on Plum Island. Uh, you all seem to be in agreement FMD can be safely studied uh, on the mainland. Can you please explain in more detail uh, for the uh, committee what, uh, what protective measures would be in place and uh, what improvements in technology have occurred to make uh, such research uh, safe? And uh, is, there, uh, is there any uh, extra concern with respect to foot and mouth disease that, for example, wouldn't be present uh, with uh, other uh, pathogens uh, such as uh, Ebola or uh, Hunter virus that we'd be, need to have a particular concern as to why it should be studied uh, off the mainland. Uh, this has uh, caused concern among some in Congress, and I'm hoping that you can shed a little more light on this so that we can all feel comfortable that uh, uh, this is the right decision. Can you press your microphone, please? Okay. Thank you. I'll be happy to uh, answer that first, and uh, Ed and Kevin may choose to add to that. First of all, let me say that the handling of FMD poses no additional concerns beyond the agents that you talked about, Ebola and Marburg, 
In fact, those are much more serious because of their human consequences and the lack of countermeasures against those. The advances in technology that have occurred since the mid-1950s when Plum Island has occurred, ha was established, is in the sealing, containment, filtration of air systems within uh, any of the biocontainment rooms and with the development of specialized uh, suits to protect those researchers from, human, from exposure to agents that might infect them. That technology has been successfully demonstrated, used for the last couple of decades, in fact, for dealing with the diseases that you mentioned, Ebola, Marburg, smallpox, other highly contagious diseases. Mr. Chairman, I would uh, support those uh, comments by Dr. Bitko. I would just reinforce the notion that uh, the physical standards by which facilities are constructed and operated in terms of air pressures, uh, filtration, and so forth, uh, prevent the escape of the pathogens to the environment. Uh, foot and mouth disease per se is not a zoonotic, that is not a threat to human health. It's highly contagious to livestock. I would just, the, the offshore island requirement is, was originally, and that, that statute goes all the way back to 1884 with just the extra measure of protection to protect the U.S. livestock industry. We have more than a 50-year record of safety, and with, along with the new biocontainment facility technology, uh, we can uh, safely conduct this research on the mainland. Very good. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Nippling's uh, testimony mentioned that uh, uh, the Animal uh, Research Service, uh, ARS, has responsibility for basic research and the FMD uh, countermeasures roadmap, uh, while DHS focuses on the development of the candidate countermeasures. Uh, Dr. Nippling, can you tell me what the focus of uh, your research on FMD is? And Dr. Vitko, can you tell me more about uh, countermeasures development? Uh, I'd also like to, uh, to ask you to characterize the work that's being done now, uh, again, at, at Plum Island, and compare that work to what you uh, envisioned occurring at uh, NBAP. Mr. Chairman, uh, I would characterize our, our complementary and coordinated programs as a linear s a spectrum of activities progressing from the, the basic sciences up to <coughs> product development and then actual application and, and for, for the industry and so forth. In terms of the basic research of ARS, uh, we're looking at the uh, fundamentals of the, of, the, of the virus itself. There are many different strains of the foot and mouth disease virus, for example. Current work stresses genomics, molecular biology, diagnostic techniques, and then the, the development of uh, innovative and unique vaccines for protection. We would hand off then these basic discoveries to uh, DHS and other organizations to further develop them. Thank you. Picking up on that point, uh, one specific example, as you may know, there is a great deal of interest in developing the next generation of FMD vaccines that allow one to differentiate infected versus vaccinated animals, an important issue for resuming trade should an outbreak occur. The, the researchers at ARS have identified several promising candidates for such DIVA vaccines. We have then taken those candidates produce them in pilot-like quantities that then allow their testing against significant numbers of an a large animals, cattle in this case, to establish their initial efficacy. And now we have then begun working with a private supplier, an industrial partner, in scaling up that production to manufacturing scale lot sizes so that we could then go on and do additional tests of the onset of immunity and the duration of immunity that are needed for licensure of this product by the Center of Veterinary Biologics and for ultimate transition by APHIS into the national veterinary stockpile. Thank you, Mr. Bitko. I now recognize uh, the ranking member of the subcommittee, the gentleman from Texas, Mr. McCall, for questions. I, I thank the chairman. I think uh, uh, to identify the need for this facility, we need to identify what the, the threat is. Um, both from a natural standpoint uh, that could impact the food supply, uh, but also man-made to um, agro-terrorism. And I wanted to see if, if, if the panel could expand upon what they perceive as the real threat uh, out there. But then also the question of um, 
Uh, you know, Plum Island's a level four facility, I mean, sorry, level three facility. MBAF would be level four. Um, I visited level four facilities. Um, uh, can you expand upon the difference there and how this, you know, what type of threat agents could we, could be addressed at MBAF as opposed to uh, the level three facility at Plum Island? And so I understand you had two parts to your question. One was around the relevant threats and how agroterrorism is different, and then the second around the uh, agents and the different containment facilities that, uh, and their requirements. That's correct. Uh, with, with respect to the first, agroterrorism actually poses significant different threats to, uh, than just a natural outbreak in, in several major ways. We've been fortunate in this country that in the past the threat of endemic disease, uh, the threat of foreign diseases would come primarily across our borders. In that case, we would have some knowledge of the strain that's coming, and the introduction point would be a single or a small number of introduction points. Agroterrorism, with a conscious actor behind it, means that the strain could come from anywhere in the world, whether we've seen it or not, or have it near us or not, and that it would be introduced not necessarily just in one location, but could be introduced in multiple locations. And it might not just be one, it might be several different ones. So this adds a great deal of complexity to the problem of what we need to address, and it shortens the time frame that we have for addressing anything that we encounter. Now, with respect to the, distinct, the differences between biosafety level containment three and four, in biosafety level containment three, we have the kinds of features that both myself and Dr. Nibbling talked about before which was that we have control on the airflow and the air pressures to, and filtration to control the presence of the agent. And that is the, and hoods, and that's the primary uh, complement for protecting that. That BSL-3-4 is, BSL-3 is perfectly fine for dealing with agents that don't have significant effects on humans or for which if they have effects on humans, there are readily available countermeasures. And in those cases where that's not the case, so in human diseases, as we mentioned before, Marburg, Ebola, smallpox, in zoonotic diseases, particularly Nipah and Hendra viruses, where there are not readily available countermeasures and which can also infect humans, then there is additional precautions taken for protecting the worker in terms of suiting up restrictions, trans interlocks for getting in and out, working protocols, and those are applied. It's important to realize that NBAF will not be all BSL-4. Much of NBAF will be BSL-3 because of the need for studying a large number of foreign animal zoonotic diseases that are in fact, uh, large foreign animal diseases that are in fact not zoonotic. But where they are zoonotic and at a high level, then they would be studied in a level four facility. Thank you. Any other panel members? I would add that another way to characterize the difference between biosafety level three and four is that the extra measures for four are primarily to protect the human workers, the workers actually working in the facility. In terms of the, uh, the laboratory physical structure and all of the air handling and access controls, those would be uh, largely the same. But it is important that we obviously protect the, the workers in the laboratory itself and, of course, prevent uh, these pathogens from escaping into the environment where they could affect not only the, the livestock industry but, but human health as well. In my uh, uh, home state, and I see my time is running out, so I want to get this last question. In my home state of Texas, Texas A&M has a National Center for Foreign Animal and Zoonotic uh, Disease Research. How would you, uh, to the panel, envision MBAF um, uh, tying into that uh, facility uh, in terms of the research already being, being conducted there? Uh, the, currently, FASD, the Foreign Animal Zoonotic Disease Center, in fact, already works with Plum Island Animal Disease Center on both its vaccine development and its diagnostic development. And what FASD does and what the consortium there does is develop new vaccine candidates that need to be tested. And what NBAF would do is provide that kind of testing, what would allow us to address a broader range of agro uh, foreign animal disease and zoonotic threats. Any other witnesses? I would just add that uh, most all of our ARS laboratories across the country, some 100 facilities on all aspects of agricultural science, are uh, 
mostly co-located with the land-grant universities, including Texas A&M, and we have many examples of collaborations and cooperation with, with our partners in the university system. And as Dr. Vitko said, uh, right now at Plum Island, the programs now exist at Plum, Plum Island, the research programs are cooperative with uh, Texas A&M and a num number of the other university partners around the country where, where the work can be done that doesn't require the on-site biosafety level three. And in some cases, those university cooperators come to the island and work in our facilities. Mr. Shea? Okay. Uh, I yield back my time. Thanks. I thank the gentleman. The chair now recognizes the chairman of the full committee, Mr. Thompson, the gentleman from Mississippi, for questions. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Dr. Kipling, uh, you mentioned the relationship between um, uh, DHS and, and USDA uh, as a result of the transfer uh, uh, of Plum Island. Can you expound a little bit on how that relationship has uh, developed since the transfer? I would characterize, characterize it as a very uh, fine relationship Right, right from the start, um, we realized we had a shared uh, responsibility, uh, both agencies, uh, the, both departments, and, and then uh, within USDA, both ARS and APHIS uh, have cooperated quite well right, right, right from the beginning. We've developed, developed this governing structure, and uh, we have quarterly meetings, and we address those issues. So I would characterize that working relationship as, as quite fine. Uh, one particular aspect of that relationship uh, was in the area of uh, agricultural inspectors and, and how we were able to, to, to transfer that. Uh, can you say to the committee whether or not uh, the transfer has been successful and, and uh, uh, CBP and and, uh, and everybody is happy uh, now that it's won? Or Mr. Chairman, I, I will discuss that because that is part of the APHIS right, uh, right. agency. We're working very closely with CBP, have been from the beginning, and we are making great strides. There are former APHIS employees who d have the leadership roles within CBP over the agriculture function, and we work very closely with them. Yes, there are some challenges there, but most of the challenges we face in that program would have occurred regardless of any reorganization. Increased international traffic, the threat of terrorism, new kinds of agricultural pest pathways all exist, and that's what we really have to deal with. I should also add that many of the functions of the entire agricultural quarantine inspection system remained with APHIS. APHIS sets the regulations on what can come in the country and not. APHIS does the risk assessments to determine that. APHIS has many roles still in this, working closely with CBP, and we think that it is indeed getting better every day. So uh, those who might have uh, reluctance about the relationship uh, and how it, it has uh, morphed into what it is today. Uh, your testimony is that uh, you are satisfied uh, that uh, it's moving forward, we're being successful, and uh, short of any uh, just basic things that come up, uh, we're moving forward. Absolutely. We think it is moving forward. And, and Mr. Chairman, I know that we're all aware that some proposals have been made to return the inspection function to APHIS. And just yesterday, both Secretary Johans and Secretary Chertoff jointly signed a letter to Senator Feinstein and others opposing such a move, because we do think that things are moving along very well, and we need to focus on continuing that improvement. And any change in the organizational structure we think would be disruptive it would delay the improvements that we are jointly making between USDA and CBP, and we do not think it's a good idea. Okay. Can you um, provide the committee with a, a copy of this letter uh, jointly signed by the two secretaries? Absolutely, sir. We can do that. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'd like 
at whatever point to include that letter as part of the record for this without, hearing. Without objection. Uh, last item is, uh, have we been able to increase the number of inspectors uh, since uh, we have transferred uh, that responsibility to DHS? Since they the transfer, the number of agricultural inspectors actually on board has increased by 30 percent. There were over 300 vacancies at the time of the transfer. CBP has filled all of those vacancies, plus added more inspectors since then. Thank you. I yield back, Mr. Chair. Just uh, on, that, on that point to follow up, uh, are they, uh, do those inspectors also go overseas to other, uh, other overseas facilities, or is that just here in the United States? The CBP inspectors are only here in the United States. APHIS still sends some inspectors overseas to pre-clear certain items, for example, bulbs from Holland. So there is still some of that activity within APHIS, but not within CBP. Was the, was the inspection process more robust overseas prior to uh, the transfer? The system is exactly the same. Okay. Thank you. Uh, the chair now recognizes the gentleman uh, from North Carolina, Mr. Etheridge, for a question. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Gentlemen, thank you for being here today. Uh, let me ask you a question, because by and large, Plum Island, as you have testified in the opening comments, uh, has pretty much focused on foot and mouth disease, uh, has been one of the primary issues. And, and as you well know, that's still a concern of the public, obviously, from what we've seen and what has happened. But, uh, even though it's popularly known as mad cow disease, H5N1, the highly pathogenic uh, avian influenza and many other diseases could potentially devastate American agriculture as well, uh, just as easily. And my question is, how are USDA and uh, DHS addressing these diseases now? And number two, how would uh, NBATH improve federal research and response efforts to these and, and possibly other epidemics that we don't know about that, but certainly could pop up in the future. Uh, with respect to avian influenza, uh, there is a uh, facility at Athens, Georgia, uh, a biosafety level three facility at Athens, Georgia, that uh, addresses uh, avian influenza and has for, for um, more than 25 years, uh, and fortunately, uh, much of the information we know and the technology we have in place today was based upon the research investments made many years ago. It is envisioned that- uh, That was before the tremendous growth we've seen in recent years. Uh, that is correct, yes. Thank you. Um, at this point, in terms of the generic uh, program of NBAF, um, it is not planned to do poultry research in the new facility, although the facility is be, being designed very generically and could adapt to any, any new issue or priority that, that comes along, including poultry. But there are ser ser separate initiatives within USDA to strengthen the avian influenza capability at Athens, Georgia, in terms of facilities and expanded programs. Uh, the, the, the mad cow disease, the transmissible fun spongiform encephalopathies, um, that work is being done at Ames, Iowa, uh, under biocontainment, and uh, uh, we have an extensive program there on various various aspects of that pathogen. Uh, th these these programs are in turn coordinated with with APHIS and and DHS as well. Let me, since you mentioned, let me ask one other question along that line, because currently the uh, Secretary of Agriculture has the authority to grant permits to federal agencies, state and local governments, or private persons to study live foot and mouth disease on the U.S. mainland. As you've indicated, to date the Secretary has not done so, and therefore FMD is only studied at Plum Island, as you have t talked about, although it is studied on the mainland in Canada. Uh, my question is, do you believe the Secretary intends to grant such a permit to DHS for the uh, in-bath facility, or is congressional authority going to be required? It, it is our uh, expectation the Secretary of Agriculture will uh, will authorize FMD work to be done in 
on the mainland in the NBAF, and uh, that will be for all agencies. Uh, the USDA programs now at Plum Island will be a uh, component of the NBAF facility. So yes, the Secretary of Agriculture intends, intends to, to that, do that. Okay, thank that you. I thought it's important for this committee to know, simply because of the authorization level. And secondly, uh, what risk are there to studying uh, FMD on the mainland and and how will you address this by uh, by biosecurity at uh, in Bath? Well, I think the, we need to know that obviously. You touched on it earlier, but I thought I'd give you an opportunity to talk about that specifically. Well, certainly the risk is that the the pathogen, the the live virus, would es escape the facility in some manner, either through physical air movement or breaches in the physical security or or uh, a careless worker might inadvertently carry the the pathogen uh, to the outside but that's what biosafety level three protocols and structures and uh, various rig rigorous ad adherence to that uh, is designed to prevent and in the last few seconds I have uh, is it possible to weaponize foot and mouth disease, and certainly I think a lot of us, certainly in North Carolina where I'm from, with the tremendous population we have, are really concerned after what happened in Europe, whether or not it could just be intentionally spread in areas. Uh, I know that's a, a major concern, and whoever wants to tackle that one uh, will be fine with me. The, the answer is yes. Intentional, intentional introduction of FMD is a realistic and possible concern and needs to be addressed. I hope you will share with us your thoughts as to how it, how we need to address it. Uh, that's exactly what we're all working on, which is through the development of uh, vaccines to uh, put to give the animals immunity, but also antivirals for that period to which the immunity starts. So, so to mark some of the progress that has occurred at Plum, and then give you an idea of what needs to be done. One of the things we've done over the past couple of years is characterized five of the FMD vaccines that currently exist in the North American FMD vaccine bank and showed that they have onset of immunity within seven days. We've also had promising results on antivirals for bridging that time frame. The challenge with FMD is that it is a virus that changes rapidly and exists in different, if you will, flavors. And so you need to have vaccines against each of those individual serotypes or strains and it's the process of developing those that are a sequential process in the current limited space. And so even doing that, we would be able to accelerate if we had NBAF. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Thank you. As we uh, follow up with that, that question, uh, first, uh, is it any more likely that FMD could be uh, weaponized than, say, mad cow disease? And uh, also, as we uh, move into the next generation of uh, uh, bioweapons uh, countermeasures uh, and will we basically move to uh, one drug uh, for, uh, for many bugs, would that type of technology uh, uh, protect us against the, the different mutations of uh, uh, FMD that you just spoke about? I, th I think it's fair to say that FMD poses a greater, uh, FMD spreads much more rapidly than BSE will, okay? That, that's the big thing about FMD. It is highly virulent, it's easily transmitted, and will spread through your animal infrastructure. Uh, with respect to drugs that deal with many different strains, uh, so the broad spectrum drugs, that's exactly the kind of research uh, that is being pursued, some by the ARS folks, some by Texas A&M and others that are looking to take advantage of advances in genomic understanding. Uh, they've done, we've done the genome of the whole cow, try to get that understanding and see what we can do along those ways. That's, that is still in the research stage. The next generation of vaccines are still targeted at individual vaccines for each of the major serotypes and strains, but again, allow you to differentiate vaccinated from infected animals. Very good. I want to thank the witnesses for their valuable testimony and the members for their, their questions. Uh, the members of the subcommittee may have additional questions for the witnesses and will ask that you respond expeditiously in writing to those, uh, to those questions. Uh, hearing no further business, the subcommittee stands adjourned.
Thanks again. Yeah. That's good. I think so too. I learned a lot. It's perfect for it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>